Thank you all for coming. Um, before I do an opening prayer, I would actually like to just start with a story that's going to set the, I guess it'll set the tone for the rest of the series. Uh, there was a preacher who was at his home one day and he went to his office to prepare a sermon. And he was in his office and he was typing out his sermon. He had his Bible, he had his concordance, and then he hears a loud sound outside. So he's typing and he's typing and, and then he hears a sound. And then he ignores it and he continues to type his sermon. And then he hears the sound get louder and louder and louder. And he realizes that that sound is the sound of his daughter's voice and her friends who came over. So, so there comes a point in this where he just gets tired. He closes his Bible. He gets up and he walks to the window and he opens the window and says, stop it. He's like, what are you guys doing? And then the daughter is just staring at him and she's like, daddy, we're just playing church. <laughs> and that was actually a true story that I read online that actually happened. And the thing that I think that's funny about it is isn't it sad at times that the picture the kids of our church get when they look at the church isn't always heaven, but quite the opposite and at times hell. And the whole purpose of us uh, coming here uh, tonight and for the remaining week if we come, uh, can we all read what it says on the screen? The objective is um, by God's grace, he could show us some things that we might be a little um, out of focus with. Um, as you see in the picture, there's a tree, and just pretend if that was you holding the camera, and you've been really wanting to get a picture of this tree. So you're standing there, and you're zooming in, and let's pretend you get that exact image that you see. Would you think, like, yes, I got the picture that I wanted. No, right? But there are some people who will stop there and think, I have got the picture that I wanted. And what, and what I would like to say is, there are many of us who are desiring to take a picture of God and to hold it in our heart. Or there are many of us in our churches that, I don't care if you've been in the church your whole life, and I, and, or the past 10 years, it is very possible to be part of, part of the church coming every day and thinking that the image you see, if you will, pretending you had a camera, pretending, some people think that the image they see is Jesus. They think that what they see at the end of their lens is truly the God of the Bible. But it is quite possible that the image they see isn't truly Him. Or it can be, but there needs to be some clarity. Uh, do you guys get what I'm trying to say? And God has uh, placed it on my heart to call this series called Refocus because um, I'll be honest, studying a lot of these things, um, I have realized, Lord, I, I myself am going to be preaching on some stuff that I need some, some focusing on. And I'm not perfect, I'm far from it. But um, I believe perfection starts when you acknowledge that you're not perfect. And um, you say that to the one who is. So I, I pray as a church, as we are upon an evangelistic series coming up, we cannot expect people to come and see Jesus if the members of this church haven't seen him yet. And I truly believe that God is holding back some of his awesome Bible workers who will finish the work that are not even part of this church yet because a majority of the church hasn't seen God for who he truly is. And you don't have to be a theologian to see God. Last time I checked, God showed up to the common person trying to make a point that everyone could see him if we're just willing to look. So, tonight, the best place to start is with who? Jesus, right? So the first thing we're going to refocus on is how we perceive Jesus and how we look at him. So um, uh, let's have a word of prayer, okay? Our Father in heaven, Lord, I just ask that you 
you please uh, speak through me and hide me behind your cross, Lord. The people who are here today, Lord, they are people who, who chose with their free will to not stay at home and be on their couch watching some TV program. They are people who, who could have been doing other things, Lord. They are busy people. They have their lives. They have their, their, their families and their schoolwork to do. And Lord, they are sacrificing time to come hear about you. And Lord, I just pray that you please bless them. It's not even about me, Lord. It's about them. And I pray, Lord, that you please use this person who's uh, dust and ash in your sight to speak a word about Jesus, the most important person in this whole, whole universe. And Lord, I don't, I don't think I could even make a dent on the topic in 20-some 20, 20 minutes. But Lord, by your grace, I'm sure something powerful can happen in at least one person here. And Jesus, it took the pen of inspiration, multiple books, to express your love. And I pray that the same spirit that worked in her will be working here tonight. And that could touch everyone's life, including mine. Prepare us for the coming evangelistic series by preparing us today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, it, I'll, I'll just start with saying that the perspective of Jesus that that a majority of the world portrays isn't truly accurate. Um, if you have a Facebook, I'm sure you've seen pictures of Jesus on there that are just uh, blasphemous. I have, a, I have a cousin who, he's, he's not a believer in God, and he, the way he thinks of Jesus is based off this one picture he used to have as his profile picture. Um, it was a really built, a bodybuilder figure of Jesus breaking a cross and he put that as his profile picture, in a sense, to mock uh, Christians. And then he tells me when I'm talking to him about God, he says, he's referring to his pictures like, if your Jesus is as strong as, as I've seen, then why isn't he helping so-and-so and this person and me? And he's making all these points. And it's interesting because his perception of Jesus is solely tied upon that he sees. And he put it as a profile picture just to mock the Christians who say they are followers of Jesus. I've seen pictures of Jesus where it's, he's a blonde hair, blue eyed figure with a nice clean cut beard. And I'll, I'll, I'll affirm you, there are people, who, there is no one blonde haired, blue eyes, clean cut beard that looks like a model born in that area of the world. I have nothing against blonde hair and blue eyes, but um, I think it's interesting that the world we live in portrays him a certain way, and there's a lot of stuff behind it. And it breaks my heart. I, I would even go as far as saying what uh, Sister White says in Steps to Christ. I don't even want to speak it, and I don't even want to think it. But there are some people, and I have seen it, and it hurts, who have posted pictures of Jesus on a cross nailed. And this Jesus who's on the cross is kissing another man with a rainbow above it, showing that God is in favor of homosexuality. The images of Jesus that are portrayed in the world, if you haven't seen these things, then I will tell you, praise God, because it, it, it hurts me to see them. But the world we live in today has a distorted image of Jesus, and I'm telling you, the Bible shows it. When the world has a distorted image of God, and we are next to the world, it is naturally going to affect us the way we think. The way we perceive God is going to affect us if we're not careful. Because the world has influence on us, but the question is how much. And tonight, we don't have time to cover every false image of Jesus, but I would like to consider one of the most beautiful images that Jesus shows us of himself. And it's in a vine. The vine, the true vine. So, uh, turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah 53, verse 2. When you're there, say amen. amen. Isaiah 53, verse what? Verse 2. Sometimes you have to ask because you forget while you're flipping there. <laughs> At least me. So uh, I have a question. 
When you think of a vine, what color do you think of a vine? Green. Green, right? Now, question. Think of a vine uh, during the winter season. How would that vine look? Brown? Dry. Gray? Do you say gray? Dry. dry. Dry, right? The interesting thing is Jesus here has the opportunity to share prophetically who he is. And Jesus shares with us he's like a vine. And, and look at what Isaiah 53, 2 says. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a what? Root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The interesting thing about the scripture is that Jesus is portraying to us of a symbol trying to show us that he is someone who has no outward beauty when he came to earth. Jesus was someone who didn't have this whole Fabio look, or as the girls like today, Channing Tatum, right? That's like a common guy girls likes. I see some nose. Jesus wasn't this Channing Tatum type of figure. He wasn't some type of uh, Fabio dude either. Jesus, according to the scripture, was someone who had no beauty in him. He was someone who he, he wanted to make the point, the beauty that you will find in me isn't external but internal. And it's just quite interesting, church, because sometimes simple things like this we lose f focus of. And, and we lose focus of that Jesus wasn't someone here proclaiming the outward beauty but the inward. And a lot of our church, including myself at times, we forget that and therefore it affects our life. We cloak the internal uh, darkness, the vomit and ash by the outward beauty. And Jesus is showing the most important thing to us isn't the external, but the internal. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, that phrase, it, it portrays, it, it, it's perfect with this. If you see a, dr a root out of dry ground, ugly and, and, and all crumbled up, Based off the appearance, you're not going to want to come to it. But, but once you come up to it, you'll see the beauty in it, which uh, Jesus is saying. There are some people that they don't have the, they're not very inviting, if you will, when you see them. They're, the, they're people where you're kind of, you're, they're not really drawing you in. Have we ever met people like that? But then when you talk to them, how are they? They're some of the most beautiful people you've ever met, right? That's how Jesus was in his time. In the Old Testament analogy, Israel was the vine. Israel was called the vine, but, he, but Israel proved to be unfruitful. So Jesus takes on this analogy. He says, I'm the vine. And now we perceive Jesus as the vine. And the thing, the problem with Israel is, Israel was the type of people that they called themselves the vine. And what is a vine? It's a source of life. It's a source of life. And therefore, if they saw themselves as a source of life, if you want life, you have to come to us. They started having this idea that salvation isn't really something we, we have to work for because we are the vine. We are the chosen. And the sad thing is that that mentality has crept into the church today. There are people who think that they're going to be at the gates of heaven because, they're, because their name is in the church book. And there are even people who think just because you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to be saved. And you're wrong. There are people who think just because they keep the Sabbath that they won't receive the mark of the beast. And they don't even realize that it is so much uh, deeper than that. There are people who are in the church who think they are safe, saying that we don't have any, any Romanism, any idolatry in our life, and they look at all the external and not even realizing that Babylon is so much bigger than the external. Babylon is in the heart. You could be in the church your whole life and have Babylon in your heart. Getting off my notes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Jesus has so much to share with us from the vine. Uh, a question, does anyone have a vine at their house? Vines growing, you do? Okay, I planted some a year ago. Um, uh, not because of this sermon, but just because I wanted to plant vines. 
a question, Brandon. Do vines in and of themselves grow upward by themselves? What do they need? They need support. So think of this. If Jesus is saying, I am the vine, is he in some way showing us, I am someone who needs support? Yes. And who is he always referring to for his support? His father. Jesus is, sh is showing us, even me, myself, when he came to her, saying, I need support. I need help. And his help, his support was always within his father. And that's one thing that our church doesn't realize, that we ourselves need help and we need to depend upon one another. And Jesus is showing us that that is a beautiful thing that we need to. And it blows my mind because when I was asked in high school once, if uh, I have a friend who asked me, if, if you had a school, uh, uh, what would you want the mascot to be? Because at the time, our school's mascot was a wildcat, and he thought that it was a real sissy. Like, oh, that's real lame, a wildcat. But he asked me, he's like, if you, if you had a high school, what's the mascot you would put? And I said, probably like a Spartan or something, something tough. Uh, and he's like, well, what else? I'm like, I can't believe I said this. I said, a dragon maybe? Uh, now I think that's really lame. But I, I was naming all these figures that are very masculine, very, very tough. And I think about it, if Jesus was there with me, and my friend said, hey, Jesus, uh, if you had a high school, what would you pick for the, for the mascot? I'd probably pick a vine. <laughs> and, and they'd be like, and my friend would probably laugh. I'd be like, that's, that's pretty lame, Jesus. But, but in reality, um, the people who have it lame is us. And the whole life of Jesus is this other-centeredness uh, mentality. I want us to consider a quote from uh, Morris Venden. He's a, he's a preacher that really had a big influence on me. And pertaining to the vine, look at what he says. A vine doesn't receive much glory, credit, or honor. When the vine itself is visible, it is not attractive. When all you see is the vine, it is not attractive. Okay, and then he goes on. But it provides the connection to the source of nourishment for the branches. Then he continues. And it's amazing to discover that the branches with all their green leaves in the springtime and the summertime and their bright colors in the fall appear more beautiful than the vine itself. And he continues. The vine is simply another symbol of the one who made himself of no reputation, who took upon himself the form of a servant, and who was willing to minister to others rather than to draw attention to himself. Jesus, when he says, I am the vine, he is also telling us, I am the type of God who will come to this earth and will come in the dust and ash, and I will want to make you beautiful. You who are the broken pearl, you who are the wicked, you who are the lost, I want to make you beautiful and you will receive attention. And it's not even about me. I'm going to live in you and, and you're going to be receiving, you're going to be doing all these good things. Now, by default, we should point the attention back to him. But Jesus isn't here trying to glorify himself in everything. Jesus is giving the, the branches life. He's giving the branches the support they need. And the vine is hidden within the branches. The God we serve is a God who doesn't seek attention. If, if you check out in the book of Isaiah, when Lucifer is referring to what he wants, he says, I will be upon the stars of the cloud. I will be like the most high. If you count it, there's over 12 words that are referring uh, to upward, um, like the upward direction, clouds, most high. Um, I will ascend, all these points. And Jesus is a type of God who says, it's not even about me. It's about you. And the thing that shocks me, church, is a lot of us, how, how many people here have ever read The Desire of Ages? K keep it between yourself. If you haven't, then check it out. There is going to be a time when we will hear the sound of a trumpet in the sky and we will see our Savior coming upon the clouds and we will be instantly in the twinkling of an eye, our bodies will be transformed and we will be looking around and we will be seeing our friends and family. We will see people who are crippled, who are in a wheelchair that can't move, our friends like Ben. We will see him standing straight, smiling, happy. 
thanking God that he is back to a form that is healthy. We will see people who are blind who will see for the first time, and the first time they open their eyes, they will see their Savior coming on the clouds. We will see people who are so hurt in a bad form, and we will be amazed and will be glorifying God for what he's doing, and then we will see ourselves. And we will see ourselves in a beautiful condition. And then we will see Jesus, who still has the scars in his hands, who still has the scars on his sides, the scars on his feet, scars on his head. The one who took upon himself no reputation, the God who is like divine, who doesn't seek attention, the God who says, it brings me more joy to glorify your bodies than mine for eternity. This is the God that we serve and a God who is willing to minister to others rather than himself. And as we all acknowledge that we have an evangelistic series coming up, I want us to consider this passage from a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. If you don't have that book, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Philip Yancey, the author, shares a story that his friend shared with him. And consider the story and think about our church while I'm, I'm sharing this. And not just this church, I'm saying all churches. So his friend tells him, a, process, a prostitute came to me homeless, sick, and unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. So the prostitute told his friend that. And through sobs and tears, she told him that, that, that the prostitute lady was renting out her two-year-old daughter to men to supply her, her drug habit. She was sick, she was homeless, she didn't have food, and it got to the point where she was even giving out her two-year-old daughter because she says that men found it kinky to be with a two-year-old. And she would give out her two-year-old. And the friend says, why on earth? And she says, because I needed my drugs. And she's crying. And then he says from here, I'm going to read you, he says, he knew that he had a legal obligation to share with the authorities what she's doing. But within that moment, he needed to share with her something. So the first thing that comes to his mind is look what he says. He says, I asked her if she had ever thought of going to church for help. I will never forget the look she gave me. Church, she cried, why would I ever go there? I, ha I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. And Philip Yancey wrote in his book as a response to this story, what struck me about my friend's story is that the woman much like, what struck me about my friend's story is that women much like the prostitute fled toward Jesus, not away from him. The, the worse a person felt about themselves, we read in the Bible, the more likely they saw Jesus as a refuge. The sinners came to Jesus. The Pharisees were the ones trying to stay away. And then Philip Yancey says a question which really struck me. He says, has the church lost that gift of the sinners finding the church as a refuge because Jesus is in the church? And we live in a world today that views the church as the last place they want to go because that's the one place that they, will, that they will feel condemned. And we have to ask ourselves, the image of Jesus that we're thinking of is going to affect the way that we, we relate to people. Um, by beholding, we become changed, right? So if, we, so if we perceive Jesus as a God who just condemns, 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 what are we going to do the day that a prostitute walks through these doors and she tells us, this is what I do, but I need help. Are we going to be a church that are going to say, uh, get out of here, you, you prostitute? Because I could guarantee you, when I read the Bible, prostitutes came to the knees of Jesus crying, and, and they felt in his presence they were safe. And we need to ask ourselves, if there is a reason why our churches aren't flooded, it's not because it's God, it's because of us. And that's something that we need to consider.
if we bring out Jesus the way the Bible does, people will come here because they feel love. Uh, turn with me to uh, uh, Colossians 1.18. Quickly. Colossians 1.18. When you're there, say amen. Colossians is after uh, Philippians. You could do a little exercise. Uh, Selena, Tom, go eat popcorn. Uh, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. So when you're there, say amen. Can someone read out loud verse 18? Just the first part. I'll read it. And he is the head of the body, the what? The church. So I have a question. If Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, then when we speak, who should people hear? And when people come into this church, if Jesus is the head of our church, when people come in, who should they see? Jesus. And ask yourself, why don't people do that? It's possible to attend church weekly, and it's possible to give tithe, and it's possible to be um, a pastor or a leader or a deacon or an elder. It's possible to have all these positions and still not re uh, reflect Jesus to the world as we should. And I appeal to you church today, and Jesus appeals to you to refocus on him go back to the Bible and study who is this Jesus that the Bible talks about? And is it possible that this Jesus that I perceive isn't even really the Jesus of, of reality? Because it is quite possible for us to think about Jesus and have this image of Jesus and it ain't even really Him. It's a distorted image. And I could promise you, if every single person in this church would have the right image of Jesus, and, and not just have that image, but allow that image to transform us by beholding we become changed, I could guarantee you we will have a, a tremendous amount of people flooding through these doors. Not because of us, but because the West Lico Church has something that I need. That's what they will be seeing. I didn't stay in this church because of the music. I didn't stay in this church because of the building. I stayed in the church because I felt that I needed something that this church had. And I will be honest, not every single church around the world has their believers, every single person, embracing this character of Jesus, the most beautiful person in the whole universe. And if we are here today because we acknowledge we, an evangelistic series is coming up, we must first start with Jesus. Lord, do I even know you? Uh, there's a story that I'm going to share with you in reference to our God not not uh, desiring the spotlight. It says, One certain night an individual had a dream. In the dream, the man was, was walking along the beach. And across the skies flashed scenes of his life. So picture with me, a man's walking on the beach, and across the sky, he sees scenes of his life. And in each scene, he noticed that there were two sets of footprints in the sand. So while certain scenes were going on, he would look in the sand and he'd see two sets of footprints. One was his, and can you guess who the other set of footprints was? It was Jesus' footprints. And the story continues, when the last scene of his life appeared before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand, and to his surprise, he noticed that many times along the path of life, there was only one set of footprints. And he noticed that it wasn't at the highest points of his life. He noticed at the lowest points of his life, he was crying out the most. There wasn't two sets of footprints, but there was one. And he asked the Lord, saying, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would always walk with me. But I noticed that in the most troublesome times in my life, there was only one set of footprints. The times where I felt alone. The times when I would call church members and they wouldn't pick up. The times when I would come to church and I would, I, I would need prayer, but no one would come and pray for me. The times when I was on the verge of quitting, Lord, where were you? I do not understand why you left me when I needed you the most. Then Jesus said, my precious child, I never left you during your time of trial. Where you see only one set of footprints is where I was carrying you. 
We, we serve a God who doesn't seek attention. And we serve a God who knows that we reject Him. And we sin at times. And He still carries us on His back when we need Him the most. A God who is like that vine, who all the attention is on the branches and He's not seeking any credit. A God who His greatest joy is bringing life and strength to His members. And He doesn't seek for them to um, be all uh, praising Him. He just does it because He wants to. Yes, there are times when, when, when Jesus rebuked people, but He always did it with tears in His eyes. And one of the most famous lines that we hear a lot is, He didn't hate the sinner, but He hated the... But how many of us actually embrace that and acknowledge that as true? Too many times we hate the sinner and the sin. And Jesus is the God who says, you are so blinded that you cannot see the potential in that person. There are people here today in this room, in these very pews that I remember four years ago, that are totally different people today. People that I don't tell them, and I probably should, but I'm proud of how, how far they've come. There are people who have been baptized maybe a few years ago, and they are leaders in our church. There are people here today that I know you have it tough, and I know that you're struggling, but you're here. And that's a sign of growth. When there is life, there is growth. All the time. And if you are here, that tells you that even though as hard as it is, there is life in your life. And you're grown. And we need to ask ourselves the question, church, I'm about to close, that as we are dawning upon the evangelistic series, what type of Jesus will, the, will these people see when they come in? They are not only going to see Jesus in Pastor Raja when he's preaching. They are going to see Jesus in the greeters. They're going to see Jesus after the sermon when they have been touched by the message when no one wants to come up to them. There'd be, Jesus, are you really in this church? I have just heard about the Sabbath truth, and this is shaking up my whole life. My whole life I've been keeping Sunday. Why isn't no one in this church wanting to talk to me? Clearly, I'm having a hard time with this. When they hear about the health message, what is this pastor talking about? Everything up to this point sounded true. Now I don't know, Lord. Why isn't no one coming up to me? Why is it that the church, this church, only has groups all around here and I'm not even included? Jesus can be shown through everyone. The person in the pew to the pastor. And we need to ask ourselves, what Jesus are they going to be seeing when they walk through these doors? They need to see the Jesus of Scripture. They need to see that Jesus in us. And I don't care how young you are. There are kids that I've seen in Africa preaching better sermons than anyone I've heard. 12 years old. So don't tell me that it's only for the adults. Let us ask ourselves, friends, will they see me or will they see the Jesus of Scripture? And to close on this point, uh, Karl Barth, a theologian, was once asked, what is the greatest thought you've ever had? This is a theologian, remember. They've asked him, what's the greatest thought you ever had? And his answer was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I ask, church, that this is what we present to these people. What's the greatest thing that's ever crossed your mind? Person of Wesleyan SDA Church. Jesus loves me, this I know. So the Bible tells me so. And Jesus loves you too. And I'll be glad to share that with you. Can we have a closing prayer? Our Father in heaven, Lord, as the song said, Lord, you are, you are our desire. And Lord, we want you near to us. And, and Father in heaven, Lord, uh, no one here is perfect and uh, we're not professing to be. And, there, and Lord, our, our only prayer, honestly, Lord, is help make Jesus real to us in the most beautiful sense imaginable. There are some people here, Lord, who 
come to uh, Vespers and AY. They come all the time, Lord, but they don't even know Jesus in the most personal sense. There are some people, Lord, that Jesus is just the name. And they don't realize that it, He is the name above all names. That salvation could only come through Him. And I pray, Lord, uh, tonight that you spark a flame in them, at least a little spark, Lord, that could ignite a lifelong fire in them to get to know this Jesus of the Bible. And I pray, Lord, that through their witness, they will lead someone uh, back to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.